morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you for uh, being so prompt uh, to start this morning. I hope you all had a good evening last night. Um, welcome back to day two of Research to Reader. Uh, lovely to see you all here. Um, just a couple of um, uh, announcements and then um, I'll hand over to the panel. So. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Copyright Clearance Centre for their sponsorship of the reception last night. I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, on your tables, there's a couple of uh, leaflets. Also, at the table at the back, there's some rather handy, um, apparently, security card-protecting um, card sotty things. So uh, grab one of those if, you, uh, if you're passing the desk at the back on your way out later on. Um, so uh, that's the first thing. Um, I'm not going to do all the housekeeping announcements. I suppose I should do the fire thing which says there is no fire alarm practice this morning. So if you hear a fire alarm, it's real. And leave calmly by the obviously marked fire exits. Um, right, that is kind of the admin. So I'm just now going to uh, hand over to Caroline who's going to introduce our panel to start the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our panel on assessing social research and research metrics. My name is Caroline Porter. I'm executive publisher at SAGE. Uh, I do just want to, before we start, I just want to draw your attention to one change to your printed programme. Um, Nicola Carr unfortunately couldn't make it today, and big thank you to you and AD for stepping in. Um, you have the speaker's bios in the program, but just to introduce Ewan, um, he founded Altmetric and now Overton.io, which tracks think, ta think tanks and policy impact. Thank you all, panellists, very much for coming today. Looking forward to hearing your insights. So yesterday we heard a lot about um, the burgeoning volume of scholarly in output and also about the limitations of existing metrics. Social sciences are in particularly poorly served by existing metrics and the value of those sciences is often questioned or overlooked by governments, funders and the public. Today's panel will be discussing the topic of um, metrics and, and measures of scholarly research with a particular focus on societal impact, the impact of research on policy, practice and public debate. And they will be exploring how we can change scholarly incentive structures and modes of communication to, encourage, to enable and encourage impact metrics that extend beyond citations. And SAGE has put this panel together um, because we are seeking to convene a conversation building on existing debates and actively supporting efforts to understand and recognise the impact of scholarship in general and social science in particular. So the format of today, um, I want to have lots of time for discussion and um, so we'll hear very briefly from each panellist to, uh, to give you their perspective on this topic. I'm hoping that, just like yesterday, you will all have lots of interesting questions and insights to share. And, I, and then at the end, I'll invite each speaker to share a, a perspective or a comment on next steps or perhaps even a prediction for the future. So first of all, Ewan, can I invite you to say a few words um, on your perspective on this topic? Yeah, so I mean, I'll keep it fairly broad and then hopefully with the questions we can see what direction we go in. But I mean, from my perspective, um, impact, hopefully we can all agree that it's something that we, we want from our research, at least in aggregate, if not necessarily every single piece of research, but alongside other qualities. So uh, reproducibility and you know, robust scholarship, uh, potentially reach uh, and these kind of things. And what's exciting to me about uh, impact assessment from a metrics perspective, or metrics and indicators perspective, is that we're very much still at the beginning of things. Um, it's all fairly new. There's still a lot of new data to uh, be collected and to be investigated. We're still getting a handle on exactly, uh, uh, slightly frustratingly or tiringly perhaps, like a handle on exactly what impact is or, or what we really want when we say we want impact uh, and how to get there. But I think it's exciting because we have the opportunity, first of all, to try all these new things and uh, you know, it's an interesting space to work in, but also because it means that we can look back at what we have done in the past with citations and how we've conflated that with quality and all this kind of thing 
um, and the growing kind of responsible metrics awareness there is now amongst research, uh, not that there wasn't before, but uh, more so now amongst research administrators, uh, journal publishers, and other people in the ecosystem. And we can say, well, can we can learn from these things and make a, you know, take a better stab at it? Can we iterate each time on these metrics and indicators and make them better and better uh, for researchers as well as the people who fund them? Thank you very much. David. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm David Carr from the Wellcome Trust. Um, I wasn't sure at all what the focus of today's discussion would be, so I, a, a few sort of uh, vague thoughts, which I hope are, are kind of vaguely uh, coherent, um, and I'm very happy to pick up on any, um, uh, on, on any of these points or anything else in the discussion. Uh, so I'm very much coming from a, a funder perspective. I'm sure most of you will know the, uh, the Wellcome Trust. Um, so uh, we're, an organi we're a, a global foundation dedicated to improving health by helping great ideas to thrive, and we support a, a broad range of um, research and other activities to further that goal, so across um, biomedical sciences, but also um, funding in humanities, social sciences, science education, uh, and public engagement. So um, obviously something that's really sort of fundamental to us as a, as a, as a charitable um, funder of research um, is, is being able to, to know the extent to which our funding is achieving that ultimate goal of improving health. Um, and so something that Welcome puts an awful lot of um, attention to and has tried to improve over time is being able to sort of assess the, uh, the outputs, outcomes, uh, and ultimately we hope the impact of the, the research, research we, su we support. So we do that both as a corporate level, um, uh, we've identified some high level sort of um, indicators, uh, 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 indicators of what success looks like, um, but also at the, at the kind of um, the level of individual sort of uh, activities, programs of work and, and priorities. And we've put a, an awful lot of effort over, it, over time into sort of creating and sort of it, collecting an increasingly sort of broad range of sort of uh, quantitative, qualitative um, measures um, to sort of, uh, to try to sort of assess the output of our activities. Enormously challenging and something that we're constantly striving to, uh, to, Im to improve uh, over time, but something that's um, kind of fundamental to us as a, uh, as a, as a funder. So key point, I guess, is really as a funder, we take broad kind of long-term view of, of impact that sort of that goes beyond kind of short-term sort of um, publications or immediate advances in knowledge and really tries to sort of look at the impact of that in a, in a, in a, in a broader sense. So something, a kind of link point to that is that we want to make absolutely sure that um, the researchers we support are incentivized to kind of do activities that will ultimately kind of maximize the value of the, uh, the research uh, that we and others support. So that goes beyond opening up access to publications, but also sharing a full range of other types of uh, research outputs in ways that they can be accessed and reused for maximal um, benefit. Um, uh, and also in, in taking forward sort of activities to sort of um, uh, engage policymakers and broader kind of uh, public audiences, audiences that can that can that can that kind of uh, use that research and involve and, and are sort of fundamental in ensuring that the research ultimately has um, uh, the benefit that we that we want to uh, that we want to achieve. Um, and of course, fundamentally, uh, perhaps more fundamentally, as um, uh, as you and said, we really want to make sure that the sort of incentives are aligned to ensuring that the research we support is is, is rigorous and, uh, and and reproducible. So um, part of the sort of key priorities for us as a funder is really ensuring that um, that we encourage the researchers we support to sort of build in those uh, activities uh, as, as a sort of an integral part of their work, and that we provide the sort of the resources they need to sort of maximise the value of the uh, the outputs that their research will generate. Um, so. Um, in terms of sort of achieving that, um, kind of current, we kind of recognise that current research assessment practices are a major barrier, and Welcome is kind of committed to driving uh, to driving change in that area. So that um, so that includes the um, uh, very much the principle that um, that kind of published outputs of research should be judged on their intrinsic merit and not on the value of publication, um, but also that we kind of that we kind of. Uh, that the sort of full and diverse range of outputs generated by research are sort of uh, appropriately recognised. Um, so uh, we're a signatory to uh, San Francisco Declaration on Research uh, Assessment, uh, and I'm a member of the, uh, the steering committee for, for DORA, um, and we're absolutely committed to implementing the sort of the principles, the core principles of that, pro that, uh, uh, of that in our funding, our funding processes through things like clear guidance to our funding committees and reviewers, uh, and ensuring that we kind of, uh, the information request, we request of those who apply to us it encourages them to sort of highlight a sort of broad range of, um, of research outputs and, and contributions. 
uh, we recognize that um, there's, uh, there's still a long way to, to go in achieving that and, and, and achieving the change. Um, and one of, uh, and I'll just mention briefly that one of our sort of key priorities at the moment is kind of um, moving beyond uh, kind of looking at our own processes as a funder and also trying to work actively both in partnership with other funders uh, to improve our systems across the board, uh, but also with the institutions we, we fund. So uh, as many of you may have seen, um, Welcome uh, has recently developed some guidance for our funded research institute, uh, institutions um, uh, around what we think is sort of a process to sort of put the, uh, the, the core principles of DOOR into practice uh, would look like, um, and consultation on that um, closed yesterday. I haven't had a chance to go through uh, the responses, the many responses we received uh, in, in detail yet, but it's something that sort of um, we were very encouraged by the sort of the, the debate it, uh, the, the debate and level of interest of that. Uh, that that sparked, and so, uh, so really, we're sort of fundamentally committed to working with others to sort of drive this sort of a broader change into in terms of research assessment practices um, uh, that kind of sort of move beyond um, looking at uh, the kind of short-term metrics and sort of uh, and take into account a whole sort of broad range of research outputs um, and other valued contributions to research. I could uh, ramble on, but I'll stop at that point for now. Thank you. James. Thanks, Caroline. Um, well, just to offer a couple of thoughts. Um, 2020 is, is five years on from um, both the Leiden Manifesto, which was published in, uh, in May of 2015 in, in Nature, um, and uh, the Metric Tide Review, which I chaired for the, for the UK uh, government. Um, and it's about seven years on now from, from the launch of, of DORA, the San Francisco Declaration. So I think it is quite a good point uh, in the uh, evolution of this debate about metrics, responsible metrics, good and bad uses of metrics, to take stock uh, of where we've got to, you know, where there has been progress, where there's still uh, some way to go. Um, and very much in that vein, we're actually uh, a group of us involved in those three initiatives, Dora Leiden and, and the Metric Tide, are currently writing a, a piece that will come out um, at the end of May, it will be launched at the Global Research Council annual meeting, which is in uh, South Africa this year, which will attempt to look both here in the UK and Europe, but also internationally, at how much uh, activity and response there's been to uh, what is clearly a, a, a much heightened awareness and engagement with both the possibilities and the pitfalls of uh, metrics and other uh, management devices in uh, the research system. Um, and I think a lot of the work that Wellcome has been doing recently in and around research culture in this broader sense has been really helpful in highlighting and, and shining a light on uh, some of the challenges that persist in that whole arena. Um, in general, I'm quite positive. I mean, I think, uh, you know, change in these ways, in, in these sorts of areas, especially in large, complex uh, research systems with lots of different actors, is never, uh, you know, never takes place overnight. We have to understand the... Uh, the sort of diffusion process of these kinds of ideas. But I think if we look um, both at the level of uh, um, awareness, rhetorical commitment in terms of, say, signatories to DORA, um, and actual more textured engagement uh, from publishers, from universities, uh, from research groups themselves, we do see a lot uh, in the system overall to be uh, positive and, and excited about. Um, I think the DORA website now has become a fantastic repository of examples, case studies of uh, things that different uh, um, actors in these systems are, are, are doing to try and um, embed the principles that are in that declaration in their actual institutional policies and practices. And I think it's that next step that obviously we need to see more of. Here in the UK, we have a thing called the Forum for Responsible Research Metrics, which was set up by uh, a group of the, 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 research, the main public research funders, so UKRI, Wellcome, um, and then Universities UK, uh, various others, to try and continue uh, and, and sort of stimulate and cajole uh, in a constructive way uh, people to do more on this, on this agenda. So there's, you know, there's still uh, some way to go, but I think uh, we are seeing progress. Um, I mean, we're sitting here having this conversation in a week where many of our colleagues are on strike uh, in reflection of again, the continued pressures that many feel within uh, certainly the university system more broadly. That's not all about research, it's about other dimensions of the system, teaching, managerial pressures of different kinds. But 
I think, um, as I say, as the welcome works highlighted, uh, we really do need to keep the um, energy and commitment and momentum up behind these kind of agendas to try and ensure that uh, we're using uh, metrics and other uh, tools of research, measurement and management in appropriate and constructive ways. Um, on the policy front, I think things are a bit less clear. So I'm now moving above the actors in the research system, universities, publishers, funders, and thinking about government here. Um, I mean, we've got obviously a, a, an unusual phase now of uh, very direct engagement from uh, the top of government, from number 10, in the uh, design and direction of the research program. And that brings with it both <laughs> good and bad, as it were, in terms of, of um, opportunities and threats. Uh, one of the first things that they've done, uh, and this is very much a, an initiative that's been led by uh, uh, our, our friend Dominic Cummings, uh, has been to launch this crusade on research bureaucracy, which I'm sure many of you will have, will have seen or engaged with in, in, in various ways. Um, and the first sort of front in that war on bureaucracy was, was the impact uh, element within uh, the proposal process, so within UKRI and within the, the research councils, the, the pathways to impact statements, that for the past decade have become a, 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 you know, one of the features of the impact agenda. Uh, they were swept away overnight, um, and I think understandably many in the wider research community uh, were both surprised and saw that perhaps as, a, as a, an ominous uh, portent of, of more uh, backtracking to come on commitment to impact. Uh, my own reading of this, and I, I wrote about it at the time in, in, in Wong Ki, uh, the, 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 the HE blog, my own view is a bit more positive in that I think, um, you know, yes, they've got a, a sort of bee in their bonnet about research bureaucracy, but actually the fact that pathways can be removed or absorbed into the main uh, part of the funding process is, is in part a reflection of the maturity of the impact agenda rather than its uh, any diminution of, of commitment and emphasis on the part of government. Um, but of course that remains to be seen. What we clearly do have at the moment is a lot of pressure on the research system to uh, contribute to and generate uh, impacts in a more tangible economic sense as part of this whole uh, debate about where we go you know, with our economy, with our productivity crisis, etc., post-Brexit. And of course with the regional agenda, which is a very strong dimension of that. You know, coming down here this morning from Sheffield, where I live and work, uh, you know, there's a very strong uh, sense obviously the further north you go uh, as to the, to the urgency of that agenda. Um, that's all well and good and I mean I think clearly we want the research system to contribute to all of those agendas. There's a lot that can be done, there's a lot that is being done already um, as the work of, of Wellcome and UKRI and others would demonstrate. Um, but for the social sciences to take the sort of focus of our subject here, I think there is a risk in all of that which is that we see uh, a, a, a reduction in what has actually in the UK become uh, a very rich and diverse and quite nuanced understanding of impact in all of its senses, so you know, economic, social, policy, impact in civil society, a, a, a pull back to rather more narrow and, and reductionist, um, you know, purely economic uh, uh, impacts and benefits. And uh, I think that's clearly something we need to be mindful of uh, in, in the months ahead as these debates play out. Um, so there's a lot more I could say. I will, I'll stop and have questions, obviously. But I think, you know, overall, notwithstanding Dominic Cummings, there are reasons to be positive. Uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, certainly those in the publishing community, I think a lot of publishers have moved a long way. There's, there's further some could go. But it's been great to see uh, quite a few journals and publishers, you know, adopting more diverse portfolios of metrics and measurement in various ways. Um, and I think there's still further that we can go down that path. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to pause for a minute and see if anyone has questions or comments from the floor. Not sure where our mics are. Ah, thank you. Just in the middle here. It's uh, Katrina McCallum from Hindawi. What, um, one of the, the biggest issues, it seems, is being aligning <coughs> the incentives um, not just within the UK, which seems to be hard enough, but um, internationally, when um, 
research is, is so international itself. And how can, for example, the UK or any individual jurisdiction um, act um, with any significant effect if the collaborators in that chain are not part of that jurisdiction? And, and what, what, um, what is being put in place to have those conversations at an international level in terms of China, um, India, the US, South America, um, the sort of larger landscape. Thank you. Uh, David. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, in terms of what's been put in place, um, I, I mean, um, so certainly from Welcome's perspective, I mean, we see ourselves very much as a global um, organization um, and so I mean we work with um, in terms of taking these things forward work with funders um, uh, 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 and the broader community include publishers um, uh, uh, inter in, you know internationally on these uh, on these issues so I, I agree with the I agree with the point I mean initiatives like um, uh, like Dora uh, are very much um, I mean I, I think there's more work to be done to increase its global Global reach, and that's got to be a, a, a bit, got to be a priority um, uh, in terms of sort of perhaps reaching parts of the world that um, have, have yet to be engaged in those uh, yet to be engaged in those discussions. Um, but I think there's a real will to will to do that, and we certainly, um, as a as a funder, sort of see this. Yeah, uh, yeah, fundamentally, it's a it's something that we have to change the system globally um, for it to for it to be effective. So. Uh, so yeah, so we, I think there's scope for us to see an opportunity, take a lead, but we actively try to sort of bring others, others with us and work in partnership. James. Yeah, I mean, I think you're quite right. I mean, it's, it is a big challenge. Um, I think, uh, you know, clearly the optimal way to advance these agendas is through international agreement collaboration. Um, at the same time, that can of course be hard to achieve, uh, certainly across the board. So I definitely think there's still a role for leadership from both individual nations and clusters of nations, as it were, in, in, in certain respects. Uh, of course, one of the uh, numerous tragedies of Brexit is that we removed ourselves as the UK from one of the most effective collaborative mechanisms to advance uh, progressive agendas on research as on so many other things. Um, and there definitely will be a challenge for the UK in uh, building new and different alliances both within Europe and beyond uh, that can enable our historic very strong role in areas of research policy research management I mean, yeah, we definitely both within Europe and, and elsewhere you know we've got a very strong uh, record of, of um, both intellectual and practical uh, leadership on uh, many of these fronts so I think there is going to be a, a, a period of adjustment <coughs> feel our way into new alliances and collaborations. Um, I think, again, here there's a lot that can be done below and around the uh, limitations and foibles of government uh, by more informal alliances, both within the publishing community and within the funder and, and, and of course, within the research community. Um, and to give a plug to one of the things that we're involved in with Welcome, as some of you will have seen, we launched um, in the autumn of last year, this new Research on Research Institute, which is based at, at the Wellcome Trust, but brings together um, currently 18 research funders from 14 different countries uh, working on issues of research culture, research careers, research decision making, and doing exactly what you're describing, basically building up uh, informal alliances outside of the, the, the sort of formal intergovernmental structures that can actually demonstrate leadership in a much more complicated global system. Um, it takes time, of course, to build from that, which is a sort of coalition of the willing, into more formal international agreements uh, or, or, or non-agreements, if you think about things like Plan S. But, you know, I think you have to start somewhere, and I definitely think there's a role in these sorts of debates for uh, the leaders to move forward without getting kind of too bogged down in having to achieve a kind of you know, UN of science type agreement on all of this stuff. Ewan, do you have thoughts on how technology can help? Yeah, I mean, uh, less thoughts on the mechanism of how to push it forward, more 
I suppose it's a, it's a good question partly because it highlights, to go back to something else we were talking about at the beginning, about how the social sciences are poorly served by, or traditionally have been poorly served by metrics uh, of various kinds. That, um, you know, if we're looking at the data to support any decisions about working internationally and, you know, how we can increase collaboration and things, to always be aware of the other groups that are poorly served by the current kind of metrics infrastructure, which are countries in Africa, countries in South America, you know, anyone outside of the kind of global north. And um, it's an unfortunate, I think, you know, it's, it's not necessarily obviously done on purpose, but it is an unfortunate reality that uh, we're not tracking things to the same degree. You know, we don't have a good, as good a picture as we do for, say, research in the UK or, or research in France around like, what collaborations are happening is actually having an impact on the ground and all these kind of things. So again, maybe a challenge and an opportunity there. Hi, I'm Andrea Powell. I'm the publisher coordinator for Research for Life. Um, and of course, it's also five years since the Sustainable Development Goal agenda was, was published. And that is a, an agenda that's been signed up to by pretty much every country globally and, and focuses very much on how to measure the impact and, and, and how, to, how, whether, you know, how we're going to put in place metrics so that we will know that we have achieved the objectives set out in the, in the SDGs. And I'm just wondering if you've thought about uh, aligning your thinking around uh, or aligning it with the SDGs because then that would give you that global platform and look at measurements of, of impact that would address the challenges, the great challenges that we face in um, in the Global South, but also, you know, it's, it's an international agenda. It isn't just about the Global South. It's for all of us to live more sustainably and to protect the, um, the environment. So just curious if, if you've had that dis those discussions about that kind of alignment. Uh, so, I mean, so this is from the perspective of, uh, you know, again, not from a, a policy side, but I thought the, the interesting thing to the SDGs, about the SDGs to me, from a research metrics perspective is how hard it is sometimes to link the research to an SDG, right? Because climate change, we all have a, a you know, intuitive understanding of it, but you can't, it's not like you can go into Web of Science and search for climate change, right, as a, as a topic. Maybe you can actually, but you know, it's, it's a grouping that makes sense to us, but not necessarily from a basic research perspective because it's atmospheric physics, it's you know, all sorts of other diverse research and it comes together and it's funneled towards a particular, uh, SDG goal, be it you know eradicating poverty or you know cleaning the oceans or whatever. Um, so we do have this weird gap, where I think it's quite hard to link in any kind of detailed, concrete, practical way, like this basic research to, but basic research, but I mean scholarly research, to you know kind of the end results. Is that that kind of impact pathway is always a bit tricky, but with the SDGs even more so, just because they're very broad. Um, even you know the KPIs are to do with the outcomes rather than the research going into the outcomes. James. Yeah, I mean, I, no, it's a very good question. I think, I mean, there is obviously that there has been and continues to be a lot of work underway to better align uh, those various layers of SDG indicators, you know, going down through different national systems with um, elements of research management. Um, I think, as Ewan says, it's. It, it, I mean, it can be. Obviously, you can you can assess stuff by. You know, by topic and keyword and stuff, and, and there have been various reports. Uh, uh, so, you know, certainly from Elsevier and Clarivate and various others on this on this topic. Um, Times Higher, of course, is using the SDGs, or at least some of the SDGs, in its um, impact uh, rankings of, of universities, um, for good or ill. Uh, so, I mean, there are some examples of, of where this is being, you know, this is being attempted. Um, in the in the UK system, I guess the the visibility of the SDGs as a as a focusing device, both for research design and for research measurement, is more prominent in areas like the Global Challenges Research Fund, where where there has been very deliberate and explicit alignment uh, for for largely obvious reasons in terms of the, the the global focus and working with partners in the global south. So I think in in certain areas, there's there, it's easier to do it and easier to demonstrate it. Um, whether the SDGs, part of the reasons Ewan's saying, are themselves amenable to playing that kind of sort of meta role in, in the governance direction of research systems, I'm, I'm a bit more dubious in that, in a sense, what you do is you collapse 
bigger categories of you know economic, social, environmental impact into these you know challenge focused areas around water or food, whatever. And I'm not sure uh, you know how far that process can run as a way of thinking about the whole of a research system as opposed to discrete elements of it. But I, d I guess that's a, an interesting debate to have. Just to follow up on that, SDG 17 is one yeah. that is generic and that looks at partnerships for the, for the delivery of the goals and looks at the data that's necessary, the, the theories of change that are needed, the, the processes. So I think they have at least attempted, because that was a, a, a criticism of the previous Millennium Development Goals, that there wasn't those systems of metrics. So I think there is yeah. a mechanism in, in SDG 17 anyway. Yeah. Thank you. At the back, thanks. Hello, this is Tiberi Signal from Scientific Knowledge Services. If I may comment, first of all, the SDGs, they have 232 indicators on their webpage, 232, and I think many of them could be related to research assessment frameworks in universities and research intensive research centers. But my, my question is, we have a lot of uh, research assessment frameworks and the latest, uh, we could see the one from European uh, Commission that you can scroll down for, down for 10 minutes on all kinds of indicators. But what is less obvious is are indicators for funders. <clears throat> How do we measure funders' activity? And there are, at least in my humble opinion, one direct um, responsibility of funders of investing and deciding where to invest funds and that could be measured. And the other one which is not straightforward is um, how funders are endorsing research institutions to attract and recruit the best talents. And that could be also measured in my opinion. So while we have indicators for, for researchers or organization and all sorts of uh, practitioners, I think we largely miss indicators for funders to see how they perform in their decision to invest and to support recruitment of talents. Thank you. David. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I think, um, I think, I'm, I, I think James might be much better qualified to talk to what I'm, uh, what I'm about to say. Um, but yeah, in terms of um, one of the key goals of the Research on Research Institute that, uh, that James mentioned was around sort of funders kind of coming together to, to kind of make better use of the kind of um, data we collect as, in terms of on our activities as, uh, as funders and how we can sort of um, better uh, kind of use that data to, to, improve, our, to improve our processes and, and, uh, and, as you say, begin to sort of measure some of the, uh, some of the things you, you, uh, you, uh, you, you kind of mentioned there. So, so yeah, so I agree, kind of continuing to sort of um, develop the basis to sort of look at the sort of effectiveness of our processes of funders, uh, reduce duplication in terms of what we fund and, and those types of things are, uh, are kind of are really critical priorities. Um, and yeah, so I, I think one of our key hopes for the, for the Research on Research initiative, which I would say is a kind of major partnership, really sort of focused at kind of making, uh, one of its key goals is around sort of making better use of, um, of kind of the, the, the data we collect and. Um, uh, and using that to sort of to, to better inform our processes, I really sort of hope that will kind of really make a difference in terms of um, uh, allowing us to sort of improve our processes as a, a funder, make better decisions, a look at the basis on which we make decisions, and things like that. I see too. You well, thank you. That's yeah. good. Uh, I don't need to add much more to that. Yeah. I mean, if, if I got the, I, I was mm. struggling to hear all of your question, but I think, <laughs> I, I mean, in essence, I think you're right that that. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of funders essentially have pushed the task of, of accounting for the impact of their investments down to the level of the project, of the, of the individual investment, and relied on the, you know, the project, the PI, you know, through various forms of, of data capture, impact capture, research fish, etc., to account for the impact of investments. Um, but what we don't often see are funders reflecting, at least publicly, I think they do do it privately, but reflecting publicly in a more open and honest way about... Um, successes and failures across entire portfolios, about issues of balance and prioritization within funding systems, which is a really, really important question that doesn't get also the degree of open debate and scrutiny that it should. Um, and, you know, as David said, I think that is beginning to change the whole rise of, of so called meta research, research on research, as we call it, science of science, as some call it. 
um, is really a, a, a reflection both from within the research community itself in terms of the range of different um, academics who are asking and trying to interrogate these questions in their own patch of the research landscape, uh, but also from funders, uh, a recognition that these uh, questions can't really be ducked any longer and we need to be bringing a more rigorous evidence-informed approach to how uh, funders operate in these systems, um, the kind of uh, choices that they make, what lies behind those, what ev evidentiary inputs go into them. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still at an early stage in that process, I think, across the board. As David says, I mean, we're trying to do it in a small scale with a few funders uh, through the thing we're doing, but uh, there's a long way to go. Um, and certainly, I mean, if we, again, focus just on the UK for a minute, um, leaving Welcome to one side, where I think they have made more progress, UKRI, as yet, despite the promise that was attached to UKRI at its creation, you know, that it would be more strategic, it would look across the piece, uh, again, a lot of that may have been going on behind the scenes, but we haven't seen publicly or visibly, as the research community, uh, much sign yet of the promised uh, transparency and, and, and sort of greater strategic intelligence being brought to bear on these questions. Um, a colleague of mine, Richard Jones, who's a physicist, uh, we wrote together a, a report for, for Nesta, the innovation think tank, uh, about 18 months ago now, called the Biomedical Bubble, which uh, probably shouldn't talk about in the course of the BMA, but anyway, uh, was an attempt to, uh, you know, use the, the, the amount of money that goes into the biomedical area of the research system as a, a way of opening up a discussion about balance across the system as a whole. Um, and I think a lot of the kind of questions we were asking there and others have asked in other contexts, particularly also around energy and climate, um, are yet to really be effectively answered both by I'm focusing on UKRI perhaps because they are the big player, as it were, now in our system. Um, uh, but also, I think, by many funding agencies in other countries. So uh, there is progress, and the meta-research movement, if it can be described as such, I think is a very important step towards that. But we do need more funders willing to ask difficult questions of their own portfolios um, and not see evaluation as a sort of adjunct of, of comms and PR. I finish, I remember... A, a great example of this, the European Research Council did a report maybe two or three years ago now, which evaluated its overall it, you know, and came to this completely improbable conclusion that, you know, 96% of all its projects were sort of globally excellent. You just sort of feel, well, this is just, this just can't be the case. Uh, excellent and <laughs> superb, I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm all in favour of the ERC, this is not a, I'm not suddenly switching sides as it were on the Brexit <laughs> debate. But, but, you know, it just isn't, it isn't believable, that kind of stuff. And we do need funders who are willing to um, share a bit more of their own inner workings and a bit more of their own sort of dirty laundry, as it were, in public, so that we can have a more honest debate about how we prioritise funding in future. Great. Further questions? Just here in the middle. Last year, I think the EUA um, released a report um, talking about research assessment at the institutional level, um, the European uh, uh, University Association. Yeah. And in it, I took three things from it that I thought were very interesting. And one was that there was a sense that universities and institutions want to change the way that they conduct assessment in order to be more open and more impactful and more guided by um, you know, sustainable development goals and so forth. Um, another aspect um, was that uh, they felt they were at liberty to change their own research assessments. And the final thing that I thought was interesting is that nothing much has changed. So despite the fact that there was a policy desire to change, operationalizing those changes seems to be exceptionally challenging. And some of the things that they pointed to was lack of resource, lack of frameworks, even though we've heard a little talk about frameworks today, and lack of exemplars of how it could be done well. And this, to me, echoes a lot of what I've heard from funders and national research organizations when I've spoken to them about um, research assessment in that, you know, there's a, there's a policy drive towards it, but then operationalizing that has proved very, very challenging because of, again, lack of resource and perhaps a certain amount of cultural change. So how do we approach that, that we, we, we move forward from this notion of talking about it at a, you know, a, a, at a governance or committee level into actually making it actually take effect on the ground? 
That's the million dollar question, I think. Um, who has the answer? <laughs> Ewan? Uh, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, <clears throat> I know, let, me, let me think about the three things. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, maybe it needs to be turned around and turned into a question, which is who is, who is doing research assessment, especially around the things we were talking about, impact well. And when I think about that, I actually struggle to think of, there must be people, but I actually can't think of anyone jumping out. But maybe someone else on the panel does. I can't think of it. Because if we can't think of anyone, maybe that's disappointing. And this, this is a, there's a bigger problem here, which is like we haven't, you know, we don't even have a gold standard to point to, even if it's manual and, and hard to do. Yeah, but, but, but I, mean, I mean, I think there are, there are examples of, of both universities and, and other players in the system funders and others who are doing, who are doing stuff and doing it well um, with varying degrees of ambition and with varying degrees of, of sort of purchase on the, the nuts and bolts of, of, you know, their institutions and the, and the cultures that exist within it. I mean, of course, all of these organisations are large and complex. I mean, that's at one level a cop-out, but it's also an important sociological recognition of the difficulty of, of driving change on these agendas as on agendas around open through these organisations given the range of, of, of individuals and uh, managers and others who have to all line up behind the same agenda. Um, I think with research assessment generally and, and certainly with the use of metrics there is always this um, bifurcation or this sort of dilemma of contradiction between uh, aspirationally what a lot of us would like to see happen and a recognition of the limitations of current approaches and the fact that then many of us fall back on them either as managers or as research offices or as publishers in the promotion of our mm. journals and products uh, and indeed as researchers ourselves you know <laughs> sort of taking a sneaky look at how our H index is performing or whatever uh, and I think we have to also be more honest about that. I mean, there's a great quote I always love on this uh, from Marilyn Strathern, the, the anthropologist, who says, you know, auditors aren't aliens, they're versions of ourselves. And I think it's recognizing that the, the, the part of all of us that slightly sort of gets off on all this stuff. Um, and also when pressured in terms of time and other competing imperatives and demands, particularly on the managerial level of institutions, uh, it, you know, it's very tempting to fall back on these sorts of processes and measures, however imperfect. Um, so all of that is not, as I say, an attempt to excuse or, or uh, you know, uh, explain away the, 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 the failure of, of large-scale progress. But I think we are still at quite an experimental early stage in many of these debates, certainly in terms of using metrics and assessment approaches more responsibly. Um, and we need to stick with it and build on examples that are going well. I mean, you know, the, the few high-profile examples, one thinks of Ghent University, for example, and its announcement 12 months ago now that it was going to kind of go for a whole different approach to management. I've not visited Ghent to sort of check on whether that has been delivered or what it looks like, how, much, how difficult it's been. But there are a few, uh, you know, beacons of experimentation in, in different systems that I think we can look to. Um, and, and build upon, uh, but I, I agree it's not it's not easy. I mean, the ref is another thing we could debate here in the UK, but that's probably another whole question. Um, just to um, add briefly, um, I think uh, three. So number one, agree it's enormously challenging. It's a it's a long term journey, uh, and culture change uh, takes uh, takes time. I think you're right. There is definitely a commitment there to drive things uh, to to make the change, but. Uh, but um, uncer yeah, uncertainty around how to implement that in practice. So James already mentioned the kind of the resources that kind of that Dora, for example, provide on their website, which are really trying to sort of identify those sort of examples of early adopters um, and, uh, and and potentially things that other kind of institutions uh, funders can can learn from. I think those I think it's really important to build up that bank of case studies over over time, um, and in terms of encouraging people to try those out to really sort of robustly evaluate them and share information on things that that don't go so well as well as things that kind of work you know that um, uh, that prove effective to um, uh, to learn from others um, and so um, welcome sort of taking a sort of minor step 
a, a small step towards uh, doing that, as, as, I, as I mentioned, through um, the work we're doing to, um, to try, to try to work with our institutions to, to begin to sort of ma map out a, a kind of a, a process or a, a suggested set of activities that kind of institutions can consider to sort of um, begin to change research assessment practices uh, and begin to sort of build confidence in the, uh, through, their, through their institutions that they're, they, they're kind of they're serious about change and that, um, and that kind of a, a broader range of kind of um, uh, activities, contributions will be, will be recognized. I think recognize that's a, uh, a, a long-term process that different institutions will, will, will need to do things in different ways to reflect their, their culture their culture but um but yeah we hope it's a kind of a, a step in that uh, in in that direction thank you mm. uh we'll mm. have this one here please so we've spoken a lot or you've spoken a lot about how difficult it can be to actually put these measurement systems into place and and i'm going to steal ewan's word from the very beginning is that possibly because impact has quite a nebulous definition at the moment. There is no agreed set of terminology about what impact actually means. So my, my question is, do you see that changing? And the second part of that is, how is the definition of impact going to change over time? Because we operate in a world of very shifting sands. I mean, it does have a very nebulous definition. I think when we're talking about it, you know, at, at this level, very broadly, but um, I think it's, it's not so bad, actually, when, you, when you're talking about uh, from a funder's perspective, and, and David can correct me, but I think when it's tied to a mission, it becomes a lot more clear because your mission is the kind of impact we want is to you know, improve public health, or if you're a state university in the US, it's to like, improve the you know, uh, policies locally and, and the, the population around about and this kind of thing. So I think you know, as you go down the level from the very abstract kind of hand wavy stuff we're talking about, uh, necessarily, because it's in general and across the entire subject, down to the actual practicalities of it, it does get a little bit better. I mean, even if we're left with the still, <clears throat> I, th I think the, the bit that's the most nebulous is when you're a researcher and you're being told to do some research. The nebulous part is like, how do I actually ac accomplish that? And there's, there's not that necessarily a clear path you can take. There's not like a 10 step program to achieve policy impact or you know, uh, any of these things. But I don't know. What other people think? Um, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I know the answer to this, or that I'm particularly well qualified to judge if there's a, if there's like a common agreed uh, definition of impact. My, my understanding is that it's a, it's a, it's a slightly variable um, concept. I think, I think Ewan's right. It's probably clearer in so, um, for some funders that. On others, what the ultimate impact we're trying to we're trying to achieve, and that gives a bit of a basis. I wouldn't, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be confident that the researchers we fund are necessarily clear what always clear what impact we're necessarily looking for, or what they or, or, or what they should be reporting. I think there's further work to there's definitely uh, there's definitely further work to, to do on that. As I said, I think we take a, a, a kind of quite a broad range of. Uh, 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 with an ultimate goal of improving health, we look for kind of the, 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 the kind of wide, widest possible way and recognise that um, that research can can have positive impact in, in, in kind of many uh, in many ways and try to try to measure that the best uh, best we can. I'm not sure if that's a coherent answer at all. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a fluffy a fluffy concept by uh, uh, myself. Whether that's a bad thing or not. I'm not sure. Just to make a request, um, apparently we're a bit hard to hear at the back, oh, so oh, if sorry. we could okay. speak a bit more slowly, that would be helpful. Thanks. I was just looking up, before I picked my phone up to, to check that, I mean there is a, there is, so you know, talk about the UK system, there is a, an agreed, obviously an agreed definition now that I think runs across, uh, there used to be slightly different definitions in the Research Council grant side from the REF definition of impact, and I think now they've harmonised that, well, they are in the process of harmonizing it. I'm not going to try and... The UK site just says impact is the demonstrable contribution that excellent research makes to society and the economy. That The REF one is much more multi-part and includes society and, you know, communities and various other things. And I think the idea was to harmonize around that latter, more plural definition, although clearly, as I said in my opening remarks, there are some countervailing pressures that want to push impact back in a more... Uh, 
narrowly circumscribed direction. If we go internationally, there are then, you know, you do find in other countries very different understandings of what impact is. And, and uh, I'm to just taking obviously something like the Australian era, the, their equivalent to the REF, has a much more, uh, you know, has a more narrowly defined approach to, to impact in economic terms than the one that we have in the UK REF. So there are challenges, but I think there are at the same time, there are definitions and there are sort of, certainly here in the UK, there's been quite a lot of progress to standardize things. Um, I think though, just to pick up on Ewan's point, I think where there have been problems is more, and this is partly behind the, the, the abolition of the pathways to impact element in the grant system, uh, where there have been bigger problems are at the, are at the level of individual projects and, and individual researchers having to particularly sort of pre-identify anticipated or possible impacts from their work. Uh, not that that's a bad thing to have to do. I think it's a good discipline, as it were, to apply to any area of research. But the, the concern, I think, that had grown up within government and within the research funding councils here was that the, the, the sort of writing of it in that formal way was, was becoming a, a, a rather divorced process from the, any actual impact that might result at the end. And so that's one of the reasons they've got rid of it. I think impact often is actually better defined, understood, measured at a sort of, high, a, a sort of higher unit of analysis, whether across funding programs, across entire departments, which is, of course, the way that it's done in the REF, at least through the use of multiple case studies in a given department. Uh, and, of course, then higher up the system still if you're thinking about national impacts, etc. Um, but all of this, again, is a reflection, really, of the fact that the impact agenda is still relatively immature, and I think we are still uh, experimenting in lots of contexts with how to do it and how to measure it sensibly. Just here at the front, please. Anthony Watkinson, um, Cyber Research. I want to follow up on the thing that Tasha said. Um, we did have been doing work on early career researchers for some years. We, we, when we did a survey asking about impact, half of them thought we were talking about impact factors. And I was just amazed how little understanding they had about the sort of things being asked of them. After all, the early career researchers are not the PIs, but they, nothing had trickled down. And as far as out, outreach is concerned, they didn't think it was something they themselves could do. They thought somebody else should be doing it. On the whole, I'm talking across the board. I'm talking particularly of the UK and US, which is what I was doing. Uh, I want to raise another question, if I may. Um, funders have, have a bad record of consulting with the researchers or the, or the, let us say, the organizations which we have so many here, which represent researchers. We know that, I know, definitely that Plan S didn't consult with any research organizations, because I've got it from the horse's mouth uh, at the ape meeting a year or two ago. Smith admitted he hadn't talked to a single learned society before planning Plan S. Okay? Are you going to do, start talking to people like Alps, who are here, um, Association of Learned Professional Society publishers? Have you had a word with any of them about the Rory thing? I'm looking at Rory, I'm looking at the site to see if we have. <laughs> Thank you. David. Oh, sorry. Um, so, question. Um, so, I mean, we are, we're doing, we've done a, a, a range of activities to engage learned societies around, around, um, around Plan S. Whether, um, I mean, opinions will be divided on whether, you know, the stage, the stage at which that consultation happened and whether that was right. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I have to confess, um, James will probably have a better idea on, on Rory, how, how at the extent to which um, learned societies, I know there was a, they actively been working with, uh, with publishers, including I expect learned society um, publishers to look at opportunities to work, to, work together on, uh, on projects. Um, James will definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, Ror, I mean Rory is, is, mm. is an initiative of mm. a combination of researchers and funders, mm. and digital science is also a founding partner of it. Mm in terms of, of you know, one of the big commercial yeah. research data players. Mm. So, I mean, it, I mean, it's definitely involving researchers. In the, I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm mm. a professor at a university, so, mm. and, and, and Leiden University. So, I mean, you know, we, uh, and we have also talked quite extensively with a 
broad range of learning societies, both in the UK and in the US, and some in Germany and elsewhere as part of the scoping. Um, we started, when we put Rory together, we started with funders uh, because we had to start mm. somewhere, and it seemed to us that they were the organizations with, in many on, on these kind of issues around decision making, careers, cultures, they had uh, you know, a high degree of agency over systems in a, in a large scale sense. Uh, obviously, institutions themselves, universities, etc., also have a lot of agency, but to effect change you know, in the UK university system alone, you'd need to bring so many universities on board. Whereas you can, of course, I mean, we have in the UK, welcome UKRI, NIHR as partners in Rory, which is not the totality of the research funding system, but it certainly mops up a large share of public and charitable funding. Um, so that's why we started in that way. Our ambition, certainly for the Research on Research consortium that we're building, is definitely to expand both to involve publishers and to involve learned societies. And we had a meeting uh, about three weeks ago of nine or ten publishers, some in this room, Sage were there and various others, to talk about what they're doing as publishers in respect of meta-research on their own uh, activities, as it were, and what we could do jointly that would involve funders and publishers and academics working together on the, these questions. So, you know, we're, uh, but I mean, Rory, you know, was only launched at the end of September, so we're still <laughs> relatively early, early doors in terms, of, uh, in terms of where we are. I've not been involved in the plan, I mean, other than as an observer to the plan S process, so I won't, I won't comment on that. Thank you. I think we've got time for one question from the middle here, and then we'll wrap up. Toby Green, I, I used to work at the OECD, um, and the OECD used to have um, two, two um, impact metrics for its work. Um, projects were either a success or a great success. And, um, and those uh, metrics would usually be determined by the director before the event had even happened. Um, and, and it was really quite, quite extraordinary that, 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 that there was never a failure. I mean, it was baked into the system. So it was a real cultural uh, thing. Um, so the last job I, I did at the OC was to set up an impact team um, and uh, to, to look at, at the, yeah, the, the impact of, of the OC's work. And, and, and you've been mentioning Brexit. Well, the OC put out a, a report on Brexit in 2016. Um, and this report was deemed to be a great success because it was presented by the Secretary General in front of ministers. Um, it got into all the right newspapers and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, the recommendation of the, of the report was that Britain should not Brexit because it would, it would tank the economy. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, when we actually, we actually did a deep dive into what happened to that report in terms of uh, social media coverage um, and discovered that the report had totally failed to break out of, out of what I would call the Guardian bubble. And it had been absolutely reached zero penetration into the broader Brexit debate. So even though on the face of it, yep, we did, we'd done all the right things, we'd, you know, the Secretary General had been there, the ministers had been there, and the media had been there, the actual penetration of that message into the, the debate, we actually measured it, it was 0 0.02% of, 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 of space in that debate. So it was a total failure. Um, now, what was interesting was that we then presented that to the OECD Council. The OECD Council is the senior most body at the OECD. And we, with some trepidation, we, we told that story to Council to say, guess what, guys, our methodology doesn't work anymore. You can't just send the Secretary General on the road to go and talk to ministers, because guess what? It actually achieved nothing. And what was interesting was the fact that instead of being chased from the room and, and sort of you know, all being fired, council actually listened. And it did achieve a change in the context in which the OC now is thinking about how it evaluates its work. So the, 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 I mean, this story really tells me that not only do you need data, because we use an awful lot of data to do this, you need a lot of data which is expensive we had to hire a company in Spain to do all the deep dive into the, into the, um, uh, into the social media data that, that, that cost us about 20K to do it. So it's, it's, it's expensive and you have to hire a lot of people to, to do that. But, so there's a question of scale and to, if you're really going to do this properly, um, which is only affordable for large organizations really, um, but also you do need to change the minds at the top because if you don't change the minds at the top, you're doing it for nothing. And, and that is, I think the cultural side is at least 50% of the problem, um, quite apart from the, the actual challenge of, of scaring up the data, um, which is really challenging. It's really difficult.
Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd share that story with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask each panellist to give a one-minute final comment before we wrap up? Ewan, please. <coughs> um, what are my thoughts at the end of this panel? I think, um, I mean, I had some interesting things brought up around, I think, just from, again from the fact that there's a lot of different perspectives and questions in a lot of different areas of impact. And again, it's not necessarily something that uh, there's a magic silver bullet that we're going to discover that's going to answer, you know, as, as Toby suggested as well. I think maybe the answer to the to measuring impact and uh, especially impact you know, on the kind of the policy side, on the, the less kind of economic hard numbers side of things. Um, tracking that is always going to be difficult and involve work and we can try and make it a bit easier but there's, there's no getting away from that. But I don't think that's necessarily something to be scared of or a reason why we shouldn't do it. If we accept that we want impact again in aggregate from research we do um, and we need some way of measuring it to see how well we're doing then Maybe we just need to buckle down and, and start working on it. Thank you, David. Um, well, firstly, um, thanks for the, the great questions and contributions, which really made me uh, think and challenged uh, <laughs> uh, and challenged me. And so, so I've taken a, a lot of things to sort of think about um, further as a result of this. Um, to me, um, I, I think it um, I think reinforced the mechanism, uh, reinforced the need to continue to. Um, to support people to, to try new things and really try to, try to measure and uh, measure and capture examples of what, what works and, 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 and what doesn't work and, and, uh, and make those broadly, broadly available. So that's, uh, that would probably be the, um, the thing I, I uh, it's kind of sort of reinforced my, my kind of desire that that's something that we really need to, uh, we really need to focus on and that we can, we, we should actively continue to think about as a funder how we, uh, how we sort of, um, well, both kind of experiment with our processes our, our, ourselves as a, as, a, as, a, as a funder, but also kind of try to capture those examples of good practice and, uh, and, and highlight them to others. Thank you. James? Well, I'd just say, I mean, again, the, the, the impact agenda as it's come to be described and known in the UK system is still relatively young. We, we commonly date it back to the 2006 Worry Report. Uh, of course, there is a pre-history pre to the debate, and you mm. see uh, discussion about impact in, you know, running through science from, from the beginning. I, I used to work at the Royal Society, and it was always fascinating kind of unearthing these discussions from the, the sort of minutes of Royal Society meetings in the, in the 17th century or whatever. Uh, but in its common form, it's, you know, 10, 15 years old. It will continue to change. It will continue to evolve. I think we do need lots of experimentation. Metrics, altmetrics are part of that. They're clearly not... Uh, a total solution. They always need to be approached with caution. Uh, we always need to maintain diversity both in the, the, the modes of measurement and in the specific indicators that we use. Uh, but I think from a government perspective, certainly here, to, to focus on the UK, I mean, if they really are serious, and they seem to be, and we'll know more on the 11th of March when we get the budget, if they're serious about increasing the overall proportion of the nation's wealth that gets spent on research from one7 percent of GDP where it's hovered more or less static for the last 20 years to 2.4 percent uh, then there's no conceivable way in which government funders and others society at large going back to the very well made point by our last contribution there in terms of, of the wider public as it were uh, all of these different uh, uh, audiences uh, are going to want to see demonstration of uh, some kind of return on investment and so that's why I see uh, the impact agenda however defined as only continuing to grow import in importance even though I'm sure the ways in which we approach and measure it will will change. Thank you very much um, and thank you to all three of you for all those incredibly insightful comments and to uh, the audience for some excellent questions and insights. Thank you very much. Have a seat.
Great. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you, uh, panel, for that uh, uh, really interesting panel. Um, I'm sorry if people at the back found it a little hard to hear some of the panellists some of the time. Um, it was kind of interesting that, that James was probably the most coherent despite throwing his microphone to the floor. So maybe that's a lesson for all of us in future. Um, so, uh, yeah, before I move you on, let me just uh, ask you to, uh, to thank Caroline and her panel for a, a fine uh, presentation. Thank you. So I'm now just going to send you to your workshops, I think is next. So last session of the workshops, this is where the workshop coordinators look you in the eye and say, for goodness sake, we've got to actually come out with something um, now. So focus. So that'll be fun. Um, and then uh, it is uh, back to the break at 11.20. It's up to your workshop leaders whether you're late for break or not. So thank you very much. <laughs>